Louise Wyman, the Strategic Director of Growth and Development at Manchester City Council. So our In Conversation events uh, are one of the highlights of the FBE Manchester calendar. They provide us with a unique opportunity to spend time with a key built environment influencer and discovering more about what motivates them and the challenges and opportunities that they face in their role. Now, those of you who have attended in previous years will know that we've been running this since 2016 uh, with Sir Howard Bernstein as our guest from 2016 to 18. And then more recently in 2019 and 20, we were joined by Joanne Roney. Well, our guest today is Louise Wyman, who was appointed in June 2020. She oversees the investment and development across Manchester with responsibility for planning, housing strategy, work and skills and inclusive growth. Previously, Louise led the design and inclusive growth agenda at the West Midlands Combined Authority and as the Director of Strategy and Engagement at Homes England, helped to establish the government's housing agency. She has led on a number of urban renewal projects in the United States and Central Europe, was also a member of the planning committee for the London Legacy Development Corporation, uh, which had responsibility for developing London's 2012 Olympic Park. Louise is also a member of the National Infrastructure Commission Design Group as an ambassador for Harvard University, where she undertook her graduate studies. So now, as everyone is aware that due to the ongoing COVID-19 restrictions, this event this year is, of course, online. But there will still be opportunities for you to put your questions directly to Louise as part of our interactive Q&A session, uh, which will kick off at about 1.45. That's hosted by another of our fantastic committee members, Lucy Smith, and that follows the interview. So normally, if we were sat in home, at First Street rather than at home now, uh, we'd be able to bring the roving microphone, microphone directly to you. But today though, we're gonna try something a little bit different. So have your questions, webcams and microphones at the ready. And with some wizardry from our supporters at FBE Central, you should be able to directly ask your questions to Louise after the interview. So finally, FBE Manchester is a, is a volunteer organisation and it's only because of our sponsors that we're able to continue to host these events. So a huge thank you to Hydrock, um, one of the UK's leading engineering consultancies. They've been an absolutely fantastic supporter for FBE Manchester throughout the last year with our online events. And also another thank you to Doodle Do, a uh, Manchester-based video and animation company who have put together the pre-recorded interview, uh, which we recorded last week with Louise that you're about to watch. So that's it from me. Uh, next up will be our uh, FBE Manchester Secretary, Martin Ellaby and Louise Wyman for our main event. I hope you all enjoy. We live in an age of progress. Look around, the world's evolving, changing. No longer is the question, can we design it? But can we design it together to solve human problems, create buildings, communities, and places of the future? Sustainable, energy efficient, and future-proofed. Providing better experiences for all. We design for you. Engineers, designers, pioneers. This is Hydrock. Hello there, my name's Martin Ellaby and I'm the Secretary of the Manchester branch of the Forum for the Built Environment. I'm delighted you can all join us today. Um, as you all know, I'm going to be joined by Louise Wyman, Strategic Director of Growth and Development at Manchester City Council. Uh, before we jump into the conversation, just for some of you folks who are maybe not so familiar with the FBE, just to let you know that we exist as a voluntary group um, and we want to share knowledge, stories and understanding of the built environment amongst our fellow professionals. We're all volunteers and we do this because, as I say, we want to try and make uh, the built environment a, a more open and inclusive place and sharing ideas. Um, we do this not for profit, um, 
And so I'm delighted that today uh, Louise has agreed to join us. Louise and I met a few years ago when I was involved in the uh, redevelopment of the Welsh streets. And Louise seemed to really get what it was we were doing there in terms of transforming um, an entire neighbourhood. Now, um, Louise, absolutely delighted you can join us today. Um, and as we sort of today look to talk about your, you and your career and the future role uh, that you'd be playing in Manchester, I wonder if we could just cast our mind back a little bit to kind of try and understand in terms of who is Louise Wyman and, and, and what really sort of sparked your interest um, in the built environment and led you on a career path uh, that you've taken. I think it's probably uh, multiple things, isn't it, that come together to help you shape a career, but certainly a very early influence for me was my grandfather, who uh, was uh, practicing in Liverpool when I was born. So I was born in Liverpool and he was the, uh, what was called in those days, the city uh, medical officer of health. So essentially the doctor for Liverpool. Um, uh, I've thought about him a lot recently, actually, as we faced this pandemic and he did a huge amount around environmental health uh, in the 50s and 60s when he was very active in Liverpool. I was born late 60s. Uh, you know, he helped um, after the war bring in clean air acts. Uh, he helped uh, with immunisation programmes. Um, so a lot of conversations at home were around health and cities. And initially I thought I would um, do medicine, but actually the more conversations I had uh, with, with um, family members, my two brothers, uh, one brother's an architect, another brother works in publishing. I've got a sister who's sort of uh, trained as an architect now, now uh, teaches, but I think there were a lot of family conversations that led towards that kind of built environment um, uh, career that I've built. Uh, but it came from a place of health originally, which is very interesting, and, and a lot of the conversations we have across the city councillors, as you would expect at this moment, are very much around the health of the city, of our population, um, uh, of our future life chances um, for, for our residents. So, so it, it's made me reflect that those kind of early conversations as you know, an early teen, I guess, have, have come back now um, uh, to be part of the conversations we have in Manchester. Uh, and it's a big agenda item that we have at the City Council to make the city healthy and green and inclusive. And those are some of the things that, that uh, you know, my grandfather would have been doing in Liverpool uh, 50 odd years ago now. Yes, and, and, and I see obviously that kind of makes sense in terms of your interest when we were, you know, we were doing the Welsh streets and looking at you know, the quality of, of housing. And I was particularly interested to hear about his work in rehousing of tuberculosis patients and, and reading uh, uh, from some research on them. You could see obviously your know, health of, of, of society and, and, and ordinary people was something really important to him. And uh, I guess, you know, it's such a short show, I believe he lived to 101. Um, so I guess, you know, he was a living proof of, uh, of you know, the, the benefits of a, of a healthy lifestyle, but more seriously, the impacts that can have on life expectancy. Yeah, you're, you're right. He lived to 101. So he only died seven years ago, which isn't that long ago. Uh, and my grandmother, who was very different, she was very artistic, very creative. I think I've got a lot of my design skills probably from her. Uh, she uh, lived to be 100, so uh, at the very late stages of their life, they were uh, Northamptonshire's oldest couple, which is where their life, uh, uh, their last years of life were. But but certainly they were influences early, so I was really lucky. You know, that's that's luck, isn't it? Who, the, where you arrive in life. Uh, so I had uh, those um, influences early on, I would say, uh, and then certainly as I started to work as a surveyor, uh, and then go on and get a second qualification as a landscape architect, there were a lot of um, people I work with. I mean, Rem Coolhouse was my thesis advisor at Harvard and, you know, an amazing thinker. So, so completely different than somebody who was um, very influential in the sort of design, architecture, city making space. Uh, we co-wrote a book, 10 Students and Rem, on what we call the Harvard Project on the city that looked at the forces of commerce and how that shapes the city and how it shapes places. Uh, and of course, I'm very excited now that we've got an OMA building uh, going up our factory in Manchester. So, so I think you know, early on it would have been uh, influences from home. Then it tends to be your peer group, doesn't it, as, as you start uh, to go through school and, and through work. And, and I was lucky to have some great professors along the way. So, so it has um, been a kind of uh, a, a journey of, of multiple influences, I would say, to arrive at the place now where city health, placemaking um, and sustainable futures start to come together in Manchester. T touching on, on your, the, the, the education side of things, you mentioned about Harvard and, and the University of Westminster. And I, was, 
I was intrigued to uh, looking, you know, back at your, your, your background on, you know, on LinkedIn. I think that's what, what we all use LinkedIn for, is it's kind of <laughs> checking on, on people. And so, so you originally started um, uh, studying in estate management, as you, and as you mentioned, did four years for Cushman Wakefield as a senior development surveyor. But then there seemed to be a little bit of a, a pivot in terms of your postgraduate studies, which, which obviously as well took you to a different country entirely as well, but looking at landscape design. So I'm just curious to know, in doing that four years, you know, whilst you're working at Cushman's, obviously so, something perhaps sparked a, an interest perhaps in the, the, the bigger picture in terms of the landscape um, architecture degree that you did. And I'm just curious, to know, what, what took you... To, into landscape architecture and, and again was it part of your grandfather's influence who's obviously a very well-traveled person to kind of explore the world and see the world and perhaps learn somewhere else you know seeing how education works in different countries as well it's a good question um, and I think this is like for others uh, you know I do quite a bit of mentoring now and, and uh, careers are very rarely sketched out on the back of an envelope, are they, and, and kind of stuck to Maybe some politicians achieve that, but I think an awful lot of us in the built environment have a, a career that's evolved. And certainly uh, where I started with, as, as, a, as a surveyor, as you've said, I got my training, my APC with um, he and Baker that became Cushman's in London. Uh, gosh, that was in the early 90s. Uh, I did have a bit of a travel bug, uh, or that sort of, uh, what is that, restlessness, I suppose, uh, to see other places. And around that time, uh, the Eastern European countries were opening up. Um, there was an opportunity, Cushman's opened an office in Prague. So I went as the only qualified surveyor actually in the, the Prague office for a couple of years. So um, I had to stamp the valuations and uh, you know, go out on site with, with the English developers, with the translator and so on. So I, I suddenly stepped out of a more traditional surveying role, I would say, in London into a much more kind of what, what we would call regeneration. It, it was um, about the kind of renewal of, of cities like Prague. I worked in Budapest, Prague, and a bit in Warsaw as well, where, where Cushman's had offices in those days. And that's really what opened my eyes to, there's a bit more to this than surveying, there's a bit more to it than valuing or uh, in doing lease renewals or in, in finding people to buy you know, buildings that we might have been marketing. Then I started to sort of uh, open my eyes to the world of master planning. I did a lot of work with Arup. We, our main project that I worked on was to bring forward a technology park, a bit like a science park uh, that you might find in Oxford or Cambridge, but we did a, a, a it was called Czech Technology Park at um, in a city, uh, in the city of Bruno. Um, and that was a partnership with Bovis, uh, Arup were the master planners. And then suddenly I saw for the first time that, that there were landscape architects in the world that you could work at the scale of of a master planner and that completely caught my imagination uh, and so I spent the two years that I was working in Prague kind of hunting around for opportunities to get in to master planning and to landscape architecture and I applied for a scholarship uh, to Harvard around that time and I was just again a bit of good fortune I applied and got a scholarship that took me to Harvard in the mid 90s um, and then then I got a kind of suite of skills I guess that were more design related uh, that's when I, my real interest in cities developed in, in how do you make and create public space, how do you fund it, um, how do you do long-term visions and plans and so on. So, so I could then bring my commercial expertise and background as a surveyor together with more of a planning, design, landscape skill set. So, so that was, it was a pivotal moment, certainly. And, and I didn't really know about landscape architecture when I was at school. It was as simple as that. It, was, it wasn't even a profession I'd I'd um, explored earlier in, in my career. So, so some of these things emerge later, don't they? No, it's, it's very true. I mean, I, you know, I never knew that, you know, I, was an, I used to be an urban designer for years and, uh, you know, I was never aware of these kinds of jobs, you know, when, when I was a kid at school. I'm sure it's all, all a, lot, a lot different now. Um, but um, but I, I was quite interested to, to, I want to just try and touch on the point that because as I, say, I think it's, it's quite clear it's almost straight away that, um, that you've got a very sort of keen interest in in the, the bigger shape of things you know the, the bigger picture the city the role and how all the changes that we make in cities impact on people and place um and i noticed that you know after you you graduated um, at harvard uh, that then took you to, i guess to the other uh, coast of, of america working in san francisco which was must have been you know really interesting at that time in particular um, but following that, I see that you know, a, a large number of your roles have been uh, largely working for, for some of the public institutions, whether that's Homes England, Epsfleet Development Corporation, the Combined Authority. And again, you know, as to the conversation talking about your grandfather and the influence he had on you in, in that respect, and that sort of 
public service. Is is that something that that that, that was was important to you? Because I know most of your career has been sort of spent working in public institutions, and I, I kind of also asked that as a as an urban designer, who's who's, who's often thought perhaps working at on the public side is the, is the best way to really shape place when you're interested in the big picture. Because I guess working in private practice, you only can exert as much influence as the clients that you work with, I guess. Um, so is, 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 is that something as say that that ability to, to, to make um, place and to try and shape things, something that's, that really appeals to you on the public side of, of things? You're, you're absolutely right. So, so I worked for two and a bit years in, in San Francisco as, as a sort of a senior landscape architect project manager uh, and I'd always worked in private practice at that time I hadn't really given much thought uh, to sort of public service but in um, in the US and certainly in San Francisco San Francisco is not unlike Manchester very progressive city you know very incredibly multicultural that real gateway between Asia uh, and uh, America um, and very countercultural as, as we all know so it was a great time to be there in the whole Silicon Valley um, kind of energy was starting to come into the city and it was it was changing quickly but I saw then that the city authorities had real influence and, and they were actually the custodians of the city so although developers would say we want to put up a series of blocks or um, you know designers would come in with solutions for how we accessed uh, the Embarcadero for example the kind of waterfront that, that you have uh, across to Alcatraz in, in the centre of of San Francisco, lots of schemes would come in uh, and, we'd, and we'd work on, but it was actually the city authority that, that um, kind of held those uh, complex and often competing projects, you know, it was the kind of holder of, of those opportunities. So that started to, to uh, be something I was very aware of. And so when I came back to the UK, um, it was actually English Partnerships that I first worked for. So that's the first public body I worked for. I had a, a regeneration planning um, and, design and, and surveying skill set so I was I guess fairly useful to English partnerships but it felt like a good landing actually to suddenly be in in that public role to be convening uh, development uh, in that case it was a development agency English partnerships was a regeneration agency which later as we all know went into what became the HCA led by Bob Kerslake and then went on to be Homes England led by Nick Walkley so that that kind of skill set um, uh, helped me navigate some of those public organisations and, and I feel um, uh, it takes me back to that that kind of uh, first set of influences in my you know even pre-teens watching a grandfather who was who was a public servant who, who often went out late to resolve stuff down at the dock um, and came back with amazing stories you know who could walk into a restaurant and get a free meal because of, of the stuff he was doing to to support um, businesses to ensure that that they had safe operating environments and so on and and so I, I saw saw an individual who was very much part of the city I guess and, and saw opportunities that that I wanted to to be a public servant as well. Well, well, you know, looking back on all of that, I can see why you know the the, the position here that you've taken recently at Manchester seems like a, a perfect fit in terms of your skill sets, and we'll 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 go on to that that position because it's uh, I think that's you know it's clearly a. The, the, one of the reasons why a lot of our audience are here um, to to understand you know, what what it is that you're going to be doing over the next few years here at Manchester. But just before we jump into that, and again, just to kind of maybe keep the things a little bit more lighthearted, because I'm say I'm conscious you've, you've, you're only sort of eight months into role and you've been working during a COVID pandemic. Um, but um, again, just getting to know you. I mean, in terms of uh, in terms of a, a, a favourite building, a favourite place, is, is there is there anything that you know that sticks out for, for Louise Wyman? The things that, that you know, inspire you um, in terms of that sense? Oh, it's always such a hard question. This <laughs> <one>. <laughs> it's like picking your favourite friend yeah. or something, isn't it? How, how do you narrow it down? But um, one building that struck me, and I think sometimes buildings have a have an impact on you, don't they? A great building will will you will have a, a kind of different experience when you're in that space uh, and the spatial dimension I think is is the real thing that buildings handle. Uh, for me I'm always very fascinated by this sort of interplay between inside and outside spaces as well uh, so it would be hard to fault the Barcelona Pavilion which for me is an amazing kind of essay in true minimalism uh, with the most luxurious sort of materials in some way but used in a very sparing way and that incredible Kind of moment when you're in the pavilion where you don't know whether you're inside or out and the way the water and, and reflection uh sort of comes into the space so, so for me that's that's um that's a sort of a fairly perfect essay if you like in, in architecture and some space that i walked into and suddenly thought actually this is making me think of 
that relationship between the inside and the outside differently. And again, that's a theme that, that I've explored in my career. And I think it's something that I can bring to Manchester, the relationship between our, our amazing wealth of buildings, you know, the architectural kind of magnificence of Manchester is I walk around with my, my sort of <laughs> uh, eyes looking up the whole time, but, but how we relate our, our architectural heritage and, and our future architectural ambitions to the spaces between the buildings is, is really important. Yeah, Barcelona, it's, it's, it's kind of a city that just keeps on giving every time, doesn't it? It's, I've, I've, I've been a number of times, and uh, but it's a place you keep wanting going back to because it's just such a vibrant, unique place, isn't it, really? And um, I, on, on, I mean, on, on that, I mean, so, you know, we, we, we all visit these places and we all want to try and bring some of that back and, le and learn lessons. Well, and you've obviously worked in a, a number of uh, places, different countries, etc. Is, is there a particular uh, project or initiative, uh, you know, that you, you've worked on that, you, you know, you would say I'm, that one stands out for me? I'm particularly proud, as again, as, a, as someone who's worked many years working on master plans, which often never see the light of day and sit on a shelf. Um, one of the things I particularly enjoyed about my experience uh, working um, at Place First was actually seeing things delivered on the ground. And I think I'll probably speak for all of the audience there. That's where the real satisfaction comes in when you see something actually delivered, making changes on the ground. Is is there anything particular that, that you, you know you look back on and think that's something I'm I'm really proud of? Yes, definitely. I mean, there are uh, projects that were very um, uh, central to, to my formation, if you like. I did a lot in San Francisco, uh, about a year and a half working on the waterfront uh, restoration. They, they changed a bunch of kind of highways that were, were elevated highways that had uh, been damaged during the quake. And by the time the sites were cleared and, and there was a whole kind of renewal program to give access to the water, to better connect the city to the water. And then I worked on a project called Chrissy Field, which is an amazing park that uses sand dunes and runs runs right underneath um, the Golden Gate Bridge. So, so those are projects that I will you know, go back and visit when we can all travel again and, and uh, things I'm very proud of. I'm also proud of stuff I've written, actually. It's not always built works. Um, uh, it was a massively kind of uh, informative experience to write uh, a book with nine others and, and, and Rem Coolhouse, you know, that in itself was a huge learning opportunity. So how you bring ideas together on a page. Uh, I'm also proud of stuff I did uh, in English partnerships. We produced the Urban Design Compendium. Again, it's never one person holding the pen, but uh, I worked in a team with a guy called Kevin McGough, who you'll probably know, who's done a huge amount, I think, for, for kind of public design and public space. And then more recently, I'm really proud of the work I did in the West Midlands the combined authority where very quickly we both pulled 18 local authorities together this is a year ago i was just reflecting it was this week last year that we launched the um design charter for the west midlands with mayor andy street and deborah cabman who is the chief exec of the west midlands combined authority and that was all about design uh, environment which is so critical to all our cities now uh, and the creative industries and so so sometimes documents can be very influential I think um, so. I'm, I'm proud of the work that I've done on the compendium, uh, on um, the design chart for the West Midlands, uh, and also led in the past quite a lot of work on garden cities and garden towns. And, and that is, is a pleasure now to see some of those projects coming to life. So I, th I think we can have influence as um, practitioners through the projects we create, but also the policies and, and the kind of intellectual thinking that we pull together. Well, I mean, that's a really diverse range of roles and types of projects that you've worked on, Louise. Uh, so I guess that's a really good segue to bring us into the, 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 the position really now here at, at Manchester. Um, so, as, I mean, as we as the audience knows, you, you're, so you're the strategic development, strategic director of growth and development here at Manchester City Council. Could you just try and bring um, to life for the audience what, what that role entails and what, what will be sort of your key priorities uh, you know, moving forward, really? Yes, definitely. So I, I uh, my boss is Joanne Rooney, the, the chief exec, um, and she has various uh, strategic directors that report into her on health, director of public health, on, on neighbourhoods. Uh, we have a big legal team. Um, uh, we obviously have the finance team and the, and the treasury and, and all those components uh, that make up the city council and what we do for children's services as well. Uh, absolutely central. Uh, but what my team are responsible for are is for driving the economic growth and, and now the economic recovery. So it's really pertinent at this moment in time uh, and the um, thoughtful and uh, strategic development of the city. So uh, it's uh, definitely a collective effort, I would say. I've got six teams that um, report into me and, and they're the built environment 
uh, components that you'd expect, so, so planning, um, the highways uh, is in neighbourhoods, but we do a lot of, through our planning committee with the highways team, uh, for the housing team, uh, economic development team, inclusive growth, really, really important to our um, elected members. In fact, we've been having some quite testing discussions at our scrutiny committees. We need to be doing more around inclusion and, and diversity. Um, so there's a whole in inclusive growth. Digital inclusion is, is really big. We're soon to launch a digital strategy. Um, so anything that relates to uh, giving our communities of Manchester, that's who we represent, the residents and the, and the businesses, the best um, opportunities uh, and uh, and also the whole kind of development pipeline of, of new um, uh, projects coming forward. So, so we've got planning committee this week. You'll know even during lockdown, we've consented a huge amount of development. Um, now the biggest uh, arena in the UK coming on stream in Eastlands, uh, lots happening in the Northern Gateway, uh, Mayfield on site, uncovering I think Victorian baths in the last couple of weeks. So, so we're actually discovering discovering the history of our city as as we kind of bring forward the next phase of development. So, so I mean, it it can't have been easy to start starting the position on, under the you know the extreme conditions that we've all you know been enduring on, on, under lockdown. And, and I can imagine with a, a role as strategic as yours. Um, that first sort of thinking about you know President Joe Biden who will have been inaugurated by by now in terms of you know the hundred day plan etc. Is 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 just how difficult has, has it been to 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 try and you know sort of, I guess ingrain yourself in the whole the whole system here in Manchester and and and, and move forward because um, you know I say I can't imagine sort of working from home has has, has been ideal really but I guess we what we've all learned is how adaptable and flexible we can be really. I think that's right. Um, and I uh, interviewed for the role back in March. I think it was the 16th of March. It sticks in my mind uh, last year. It was it was literally the the Monday before the following Monday that we locked down. And it was a question Joanne rightly asked at an uh, interview, you know, what, what's your 100 day plan? Uh, and the answer I gave then, not not knowing that we were about to lock down, we, we've often uh, reflected on it in the, in the months that have gone past since, you know, I failed, I got that completely wrong. So what I thought I would be doing, I thought I'd be in the city more. You know, the, the magic of Manchester, I think, is that um, uh, incredibly engaged uh, community that we have around uh, around what's right for the city, how, how we drive growth, but how we how we change and, and uh, place make and innovate and, you know, uh, drive into new sectors and so on. So, so I imagined I'd be meeting with key people from the university, with from our anchor institutions, you know, forgetting to know my own team. And I have managed to, between um, the various lockdowns, I've, I've managed to move up to the city, get a flat, uh, and before this most recent um, period of working from home, then I was in the city two or three days a week, every week. So, so there, there is a bit of that that I've been able to do, but we've also been managing a public health crisis. I've learned more about vaccination programs around, um, you know, how you mobilize. Uh, we've now mobilized seven sites uh, across the city to do mass vaccination, you know, that wasn't in the 100 day plan, I, I couldn't have seen that coming, but but none of us could, and the sheer strength of team working has been um, uh, incredible to be part of, actually, and to, and to think about what is the role of of the built environment uh, in, in this kind of time of, of crisis, and how can partners uh, engage with us, how, how can the business community, um, uh, and certainly the professionals that are part of your network, how, how can they help kind of shape the way out of this time which is is that's the piece of work we're starting to do now that kind of forward planning what, what happens between april and june starts to be really important we, we hope for a relatively quick recovery when we can because the underlying principles um you know within the economy uh, are sound but we've got a hell of a hell of a kind of work effort on we will need to engage partners in that well it's, it's interesting because whilst we've touched on the difficulties that COVID has posed for, for many of us, um, and I guess it's like any sort of monumental shift, whether it was the 2008 financial crash, COVID, but what, what it, for me, what it often does is it, it, it's, it's one of those times for, for, for new thinking to come through new ideas, because as, as well as I mean, COVID asks some really strong questions about the, the future, I guess, of, of cities and things like, you know, large floor plate offices, et cetera, will we be working, you know, from from our homes, maybe a little bit more, um, and, and and getting a more of a, a blended balance, um, and as we all know, the, the climate crisis isn't isn't going away at all. So th there's, there seems to be a, a fantastic opportunity here to kind of really look. Well, what, what really is the future of a of a vibrant, inclusive 
City, because I think there, there will be leaders and followers in terms of the, the future role of cities here. And given that Manchester is the original modern city, and I guess as the old, you know, well, I guess the, the questionable comment, whether whether um, Tony Wilson did say this is Manchester, we do things differently here or not. But, um, but Manchester seems really well placed to really take hold of that with its original modern city one. And is this now time for the original modern city two in terms of what is the, the because, because cities will have to change, I think, going forward, climate, COVID, you know, these things aren't going to go away. So, um, so it's I think it's a really exciting time for Manchester as, uh, to be, as, as that sort of very vibrant, dynamic city to, to, to look to lead rather than follow, really. I totally agree with you, Martin. And, it, and it's what Manchester does, isn't it? It's how we yeah. respond to adversity, actually. If you, if you think of, you know, in, in recent history, the, you know, the Arndale bomb and then, and then more recently the arena bomb, it's how the city comes together. It, it is that phenomenal community we've got. I haven't, I have worked in many other cities as, as we've talked about, but I've never felt the the kind of warmth that you get to the, the embrace of the, the sort of Manchester community, even through the, the screens and all these kind of remote meetings we're having to have. It's It's been phenomenal, the number of people that have come and offered support and, and kind of helped uh, me think through, you know, the, the challenge ahead. I also think the pandemic does uh, give us a mandate to do things differently. In a way, we, we will have to respond in a different ways. So very quickly through the summer of, of last year, again, with business partners, ne never in isolation. I think that's the way, well, it is absolutely the way we work as a city council to, to do this in collaboration, that kind of our Manchester value set that we have as a city. Uh, we produced an economic recovery and investment plan that was launched on the 25th of November last year to coincide with the budget um, statement that the Chancellor made. So that was Manchester being very clear. We identified 50 projects that were seeking £800 million worth of investment. So that was a very um, uh, thought through and, and kind of direct ask, if you like, of government and, and of um, different departments uh, of how they may be able to engage. There's now work uh, that I'm doing that, that gets going uh, this week in terms of taking some of those kind of plans into implementable you know, strategies that we can implement uh, and deliver on. So there's, there's a stage of work to go. Uh, so I think it's really key that we get the economic piece, the investment piece right, uh, and we position ourselves to, to um, be that global city that, that we know we are, but you, you have to kind of create the right narrative for that. And then I think there's definitely a spatial dimension. So so uh, there's one, one piece is the words and the economics, isn't it? And, and another piece is, well, what does that look like? Uh, and, and where is that vision? Uh, and where's that, that big city plan? Uh, and I suspect as we start to bring forward our local plan, which we now need to do, uh, you will see that begin to emerge as well. So that's, that's something I'm actually looking forward to, to getting stuck into. And, and, and I guess, you know, as, as, as we, we, we reposition the city for the future, and I guess, you know, as, as Manchester has brought in um, lots of investment, and more recently we've, we've kind of seen Salford really starting to, to catch up, if, if I guess, and um, I hope that's not too controversial to the audience out, out there. Um, but, I mean, how, so how important do you think, I guess it's going to be important that you liaise and communicate quite closely with the Salford team, because obviously the city centre now is, is, is very much blurring the boundaries between Manchester and Salford. And that dividing line, I guess, which was always like the Irwell running through the city, is that, that ex the expansion of development has gone way beyond that now. Um, so I guess in terms of uh, how, how do you see that, that relationship working with Salford? Is that, is that something you've already initiated? Yes, certainly begun those conversations, and you're right, they are, I mean, it's, it's pretty skinny, isn't it, the Irwell, at the point, point you know, if you think of the crossing into the, by the cathedral there, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a, sh a short distance between the two, and we have lots of discussions, I mean, there is a whole uh, suite of GM discussions, uh, and we have a Directors of Place uh, forum that I'm part of, that the, the Salford team and all the other members of, of um, the other GM place directors are at. So there's a there's a big piece that we do to kind of join up. I would say I think there's probably more we can do as well. You know, um, it was the experience I I brought from West Midlands Combined Authority that actually uh, there's always the temptation to be competitive to kind of look after your own geography. But when when you start to look at that kind of city region, um, which is what GMCA helps us do, then then there's lots of synergy and there's lots of businesses that may want to. Um, you know, be based in Salford, but actually they're going to be going out in, in the Manchester uh, facilities. You know, um, the cultural uh, impact of COVID is, has been brutal, really, hasn't it? But, but we've got to find ways and we are finding ways of getting grants into cultural institutions. You know, we've got a big grant um, that's gone into the factory from Arts Council England. 
24 million has just gone in there to make sure that the factory does come online at our facilities, our theatres, our, our restaurants uh, in Manchester. We, we know that they're, they're used um, and enjoyed by, by residents of Salford as well. And that's how it should be when you're, you've got cities that are so close. So I think there's, there's a lot of complementarity. There's, there's probably more, and I think I've got to be honest, there's more we can do in the collaborative space. And there's more of that kind of bigger thinking around um, you know, Manchester is the economic engine for the city region, but, but how do we, how do we share our, um, our kind of uh, impact with our immediate neighbours? Stockport is, uh, you know, again, the city council, we have lots of conversations with, uh, they're so close, aren't they? But when I um, worked in the US, you know, cities <laughs> were uh, often a flight apart, whereas, you know, we, we've got these senses of urbanity that are touching each other. And, and you know, with, with, the, that question, I guess, of you know, the, the, the what's the function of the city, and I have every confidence that both you know Manchester and, and Salford would continue to attract investment, and we've got some really amazing skylines you know, going up in the place right now. Um, but I, I think again, touching back on more of the social aspects, I think again, you know, cities are, are nothing without its citizens and its people, and I guess you know, again, there's a there's a commonly held argument that that, that the most sustainable and inclusive city is the child friendly city i mean examples of you know vancouver and to, to barcelona and their super blocks and and i often feel that, that actually maybe maybe manchester could do more to be a little bit more inclusive in terms of you know making it more of a, a family destination again thinking about retail is 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 die, dying and i don't think it'll ever come back to the, the the point that it was we may not have people working in the city center in the same ways that, that we did and perhaps our cities you know, will take on a, a, a slightly different role as we evolve in being about about people and about a place of, of, of civic and societal exchange, I guess, you know, so what I'm thinking about, you know, is older people, younger people, um, and what what the city can do there. I mean, I, I, there's obviously there's amazing things coming forward, things like Mayfield, etc. And um, is, is there anything you'd like to expand on that in terms of the, 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 the making this show that this city, all the bits that connect the, the statement buildings, are still incredibly high quality, easy to move around, inclusive. Um, is there anything on, on that you'd like, like to touch on, Louise? Yes, happy to. I think you, you're spot on as well, because when we talk about inclusive growth, you know, it, it is about sometimes those um, communities that might have been harder to engage or, or for hard, harder for us um, to, to support. Uh, and there's a lot I think we can do um, uh, around the kind of quality of place, uh, if I use that in, in its broadest sense. So um, the ambitions we have have always been for high quality design, for, for great place making. But actually as the city moves into this, uh, what I very much hope is a post COVID phase during this year and, and that recovery does spark back up, you know, it's competitive, isn't it? P people will be drawn to cities where they have a, a good experience, where they can raise their kids, where they can get them into a, a decent school, or, or their elderly relatives are going to have access to healthcare um, uh, and those wider sort of adult services that that we look after within the city council. So, so that's very much in the DNA of the city council. I would say to think about children. We, we've got a director of strategic director for children's services. We've got a strategic director for adult services. So, so they sit alongside me. That's the, the governance of everything we've talked about in terms of place making needs to work for for those communities and uh, i'm hopeful that we can do much more in the connective spaces that that's the thing that struck me as well i've said this in other interviews there's so many uh, great kind of set pieces if you like across manchester but how we connect them all together um i've done quite a bit of walking around following the river uh, well looking at what more we can do to give access to uh, our rivers but also our canals you're seeing that at mayfield where we're we're you know, um, uh, opening up the, the Medlock. Uh, and then in the north of the city, a massive project coming uh, on stream with the City River Park that we're doing with FEC that, that will um, bring uh, new development to, to the north of the city, but also a whole linear park uh, following the river corridor so that people can walk and cycle and uh, rollerblade or whatever they want to do down into the city centre uh, and do that in a way that is you know, a quality experience where there are play areas where you can get kind of active active uh, travel as well as kind of going about your daily life. So, so there's a huge amount that I want to do around movement, around access to nature. Um, we're bringing other partners on board to help us think through some of that. Uh, and again, I think uh, those sort of quality of life um, 
uh, moments are often shaped by how we travel around and how we go about our daily life. And if you have a good experience traveling into the city center, you're going to do it more. If you, you find great things to do when you get there that family members of all ages can enjoy, that's going to draw you back. And, and that's where we'll have to put some emphasis because, because this is competitive now. Uh, it always has been, but it feels more so as, as we recover. And one thing I'm massively energized by actually is the talent that we've got in Manchester coming through our universities, the digital kind of acceleration uh, that's happened during this time. Uh, I, I again shout about this, but we've now overtaken Cambridge as the city outside London that is the best place to grow additional business in the UK, We're one of the fastest growing cities for uh, digital and tech and life sciences and, uh, and the kind of health innovation sector. So those are really strong foundations, um, but we need to, to make the most of them as we develop. Well, I'm, I'm sure with, you know, having got to sort of know you a little bit better today, Louise, and, and knowing jo Joanne as well, um, both both of whom have a very sort of strong social, you know, I guess not conscious is the word, but um, but I have every confidence that, you know, that the city, is, as well as its, you know, its buildings and its statement pieces will will, will become that city that, that does become that, um, I guess, a beacon of, of civic inclusiveness, really. Um, now, I'm conscious of, of, of the time, and I think we, we probably need, need to wrap up first before we uh, move over on to, to give the audience an opportunity to, uh, to open up the Q&A. But, it, I, I mean, you sound like you're chomping at the bit to get going, and I can see why there's lots of really exciting opportunities coming forward. But, obviously, we've got a very captive audience here of, of developers, contractors, consultants, uh, and I realise, obviously, you're not, you're not too long to position, so we don't want, I'm not going to go into too much um, detail, but what, what, what sort of you know, big big picture message you've got for the audience out there, what they can expect to see coming forward over the next 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 few years, maybe. I'd like to um, really build the partnerships we have, and, and it's um, something I'd love to do with you and your network, actually, Martin, to, to have some regular sessions where we bring, um, as a city, we bring some of our ambitions, our proposals, and, and then uh, ask the, the, the development community to help us kind of shape how we address those challenges. So I think we'll, we'll be very clear as a city about, about where our ambitions lie. We, we've uh, set a lot of those out in the um, economic recovery and investment plan that I talked about. We'll set out some of the, the spatial ambitions uh, and there's, there's big things we can do around the kind of health and inclusion and definitely the zero carbon agenda. So those are themes that I have for, for a healthy, greener and more inclusive city. Well, Louise, I have to say, I've thoroughly enjoyed our little chat today and I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. Um, and on behalf, really, of, of all the team that have helped me today at the FBE and on behalf of our, our audience today, thank you for your time. We really appreciate that. We know you're, you're incredibly busy. Uh, and it now leaves me, really, I guess, to, to hand over to the question and answers um, to the floor. So, so thank you, Louise. Thanks for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you. Well, wasn't that brilliant to hear from Louise? And now this is the fun bit. This is going to be the slightly happy chaos because obviously if this was a, a live event, we'd be able to walk around with a microphone and people could ask some questions of Louise. So we're gonna try and do something a bit more interactive than just on the chat. So if you do have a question, thank you to everybody who's already started using the chat. Please put your question in the chat. And then uh, what I'm gonna do is I'll go down and I'll ask your name. And, and then if you could come off mute and put your camera on just to ask your question, that would be brilliant. So let's try and keep the questions fairly short if we can. And also just to say, if we don't get to you, it's not that your question wasn't brilliant, it was that we ran out of time. But thank you so much. So we're gonna try this, if that's okay, Louise. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, and, Lucy. And just, just to thank you, Louise, it was great to hear from you. I mean, it was brilliant to hear about your idea of healthier, greener and more inclusive city. So just off the bat, um, would you like to just explain a little bit about which area of that you'll be focusing on primarily? Yes, happy to. There, there, I mean, there are three big ambitions which, which we need to bring forward together. Um, but the health agenda is so primary now, you know, we all feel that I'm sure. Uh, and it's really made us probably all reflect that the health is the most important thing we have, isn't it, as, as, as individuals. Uh, and there's a big responsibility that we have as city council for the health of our communities. So I've been on calls this morning with Health Innovation Manchester, an amazing organisation that I'm learning about. We've actually got some real strengths in the city, in life sciences, in, in biotech. 
you know, all that great kind of talent around the Oxford Road corridor. Uh, and a, a big priority that we've set out in the recovery plan is to do far more for North Manchester, because actually that's one of the areas where we've got the biggest inequalities in health as well, uh, where we've got real levels of deprivation and poverty. Uh, and it's amazing actually to see the investment that's going in. So two billion pounds worth of investment will go into uh, the north of Manchester, into the city hospital redevelopment, into the Northern Gateway project. And we're going to start to look at some um, urban frameworks for, for what more we can do to bring forward that that kind of big renewal piece. So, so health is huge. And I, and I think if you were to say where in the city is health really going to kind of start to be visible and the healthy place making agenda in particular, then uh, lots, lots to watch in the north of the city. Uh, green has been an agenda for a long time. We're a progressive city, aren't we? And we've got a net zero carbon ambition for 2038. Uh, lots of new parks coming on online. I'm really proud of the Mayfield Park, which will be the biggest park for 100 years. Uh, lots in the press about that, but actually some great public spaces as well. When Albert Square is redeveloped, I think I think we'll have a new kind of uh, open space there. There's lots. We've been having conversations uh, with people like Tom Bloxham about his ambitions for the Blue Line, which opens up the canal ways uh, to better connect our kind of blue and, and green infrastructure. Uh, so lots of kind of physical things we can do around green space, um, but also how do we get to net zero carbon? We're going to need the help of our, our scientists and our innovators to help us do that. Uh, and then inclusion is massive. It, I think it's it runs through every conversation we have, actually. And, and uh, I've been, um, uh, you know, very optimistic about the future of Manchester. Actually, for some of our communities, it isn't so rosy right now. We've got real digital exclusion. We've got school kids who, who can't be in school, we know, but they can't uh, even access learning at home because they haven't got access to to uh, tablets or you know um, the IT, so uh, and that's not just youngsters; that's our older population as well. So we've got to uh, be far smarter in how we respond to the challenge around inclusion. Uh, uh, digital is a big piece that I lead on, and we will will be bringing our digital strategy forward. So, so I wouldn't say that health, uh, uh, green, or or uh, inclusion are kind of separate things; they they run together, but they're very kind of clear priorities across the city council. Yeah, it's great to hear that, Louise. Thank you so much. Um, OK, we're going to go to Lee Trina, if that's OK, from HBD. Um, would you mind just asking your question, Lee? Yeah, thanks, Lucy. Good afternoon, Louise. Um, my question was, um, if you could make one instant change to process or procedure around urban generation, just, you know, magic wand stuff, you could literally just make it instantly, what, what would it be? Wow, uh, a great question. Uh, I tell you what, this for me, we have seen real acceleration uh, through the pandemic because we've had to, we've had to respond and we've had to do away with some of our, our red tape. I'll give you an example um, uh, in the public realm around the city centre when we realised that people could only probably socialise outside, it was hard for restaurants to operate. Uh, we very quickly relaxed some of our, uh, not relaxed, but, but kind of modified some of our licensing arrangements, you know, enabling tables and chairs to go outside or enabling businesses to kind of occupy pavements and streets. Uh, we quickly closed, uh, pedestrianized uh, 20 streets across the city. And actually speaking to our highways team, they said normally that would have taken two years because of the consultation you'd have had to go through because of all the engagement and actually in a crisis situation, you often kind of cut through the, what do you, what do you have to really do? Uh, apply some common sense and it made perfect sense to, to you know, rapidly close off streets, rapidly enable businesses to kind of operate in the public realm as well, and actually change then the experience of how how uh, we've socialised in the city through those those periods through through the summer and autumn months. So actually, we've taken a lot of learning from that. So I think I think my uh, what I want to do very keenly coming out of of this phase of of um, the the pandemic and the, and the lockdown experiences that we've all had is, is take some of the good stuff too. And some of that would be around, do we really need to have all those processes? Does it really need to take so long to, to change? And actually we've proven that we can bring effective change um, without too much bureaucracy. So, so I think it has given us a bit of a, a kind of rapid shot in the arm in terms of how, how to, to learn about doing things in a, in a slightly more fleet of foot way. Great, thank you. Thanks, Lee, for that question. Um, is Nicholas Atherton still with us? Would he like to ask his question just around targets? I'm still here. 
Wonderful. Go for it, Nicholas. Uh, yeah. Hi, hi Louise. Uh, just first, as the landscape architect myself, I'm, I'm really excited to see what you're going to be bringing to the city over the next few years, and I wish you all the best. Um, so, uh, I, it's a quick question, really. Um, I think one of the, as much as I love Manchester, one of its, I think, widely agreed failings is its chronic kind of um, lack of city centre green space. So, I was just wondering if there are any specific targets that are going to be created to combat that. It's great to find another landscape architect. Uh, thank you for saying hello. Um, and I think there's a huge role for landscape architects. You, you would probably expect me to say that, but it's something that struck me about Manchester is that that it is still quite a hard city, isn't it, in terms of its sort of materials and um, uh, and we don't have those. We do we do have a lot of great parks actually, but but they're not necessarily right in the centre. They're not necessarily the things you first find. You kind of discover them more more than kind of. Uh, get orientated towards them through the kind of layout of the city so so i think uh, we, we don't have kind of quotas if you like for green space but we're now starting to do a bit of visioning work around the how do we really you know create better green spaces the, the big part going into mayfield there's an amazing uh, initiative that's coming down from the northern gateway in into victoria the city river park which will create uh, connectivity you know walking routes um there's, there's so much more we can do and we're, doubt, we're about to, we've started the early sort of consultation phases for the local plan that's getting going and, and I think that's some of the feedback we'll probably pick up from from residents as well is that uh, we're hearing it loud and clear through this year in particular that that uh, access to nature matters you know uh, access to being able to have spaces that you can you know um, community gardens where you can grow stuff the, the natural um, uh, the benefits of access to nature, the mental health benefits of access to nature, places to recreate. I think we think about all that very differently now because of the experiences we've had. Um, so I don't think we will have a quota as such, but we will definitely uh, develop a local plan that, that um, mandates for, for you know, greater connectivity to nature, to open space, to green corridors. And, and there's a big piece on our biodiversity agenda there as well. So, so to become a green, a zero carbon city, we need to do more in the biodiversity space. So we're going to look at some nature-based solutions as well. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Louise. Thank you, Nicholas. Great question. Um, is Dan, uh, Dan Mitchell around? Just a question around the kind of social deprivation of the neighbourhoods just outside the city centre. A brilliant question if Dan would like to ask that. Uh, hello, everyone. Afternoon. Can you see me? Yeah, we can. Thanks, Dan. Go for it. Uh, hi, Louise. I wanted to ask a bit about, you know, we heard a lot in, in Manchester from the TV programme Manctopia. We've heard a lot um, and perhaps a bit of criticism about Manchester's delivery of affordable homes um, in communities as well. So I just really wanted to ask a little bit about, uh, you know, how we can all, because I think it is incumbent on us all, start to reach out and, and, and expand that development and growth strategy agenda into some of the communities and some of our deprived communities across the city. So interested in hearing your views on that. Thank you, Dan. Um, housing is really close to my heart, actually. My, my previous role, as Lucy has said, and others have said, it was with um, Homes England. And I, I think there's a huge amount we can do in the affordable housing space. And, and actually, we are doing. Uh, I mean, the, the housing story of Manchester is one of change, isn't it? I think 20 odd years ago, very few people living in the centre of the city. It's, it's been a big part of our strategy kind of for renewal is to bring those homes in. And I think we've successfully built an awful lot of housing. I was being given a statistic last week that Manchester's delivered more housing uh, in the last couple of years than any London borough, you know, and we have different pressures. So so we know we can deliver. What we haven't delivered is as much affordable housing as we should, which I think is, is the roots of your question and also into the neighbourhoods that that um, have suffered from deprivation and, and need that investment and renewal. So uh, lots happening in the housing space around Northern Gateway. that will be 15,000 new homes uh, at committee last week, we made the decision to bring Northwoods, which is the ALMO, the arms length uh, management organization for, for uh, 13,000 homes, predominantly in the north of the city, that ALMO comes back in house in, into the city council. So that will mean we'll have a very direct relationship with our affordable tenants. Uh, and we're also gonna get underway this year, you'll see more in the press soon uh, with a local, uh, delivery vehicle to deliver our own uh, affordable housing or scheme coming forward uh, in the back of ANCOS as the first 
Manchester City Council a housing scheme. So I think there's an awful lot we can do in the housing space. Uh, and the, the brilliance, again, of that kind of partnership network that you have across Manchester. We've got the Manchester Housing Providers Partnership. We've got an event coming up with them in February to look at how we can kind of lever that partnership. That's the registered providers um, across the city that, that share our ambitions. Um, so I, I think there's a lot more to do. I think we could be proud if you look back 20 years, but, but the next 20 years need to be how we really address that that um, social imbalance I've touched on and provide for the communities that have been uh, disadvantaged uh, in recent times. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you, Dan, for the question. That's brilliant. And um, something that probably leads on from that, Louise, is just the question from Charlotte Woods. Charlotte, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hiya. Um, so I'm one of the many people, in fact, there might be many on these call who um, attended the University of Manchester and then stayed in Manchester as a result. So I guess my question is, what are your plan plans and thoughts towards the student aspect of the city? Um, because I think a lot of people start their Manchester lives in, in that area and then, as I said, stay in the city. Thank you, Charlotte. That is a great question. It's great to, to hear that you've had that experience too of coming to study and staying. Uh, and, and you're right, that is a real, it's one of Manchester's strengths actually. It's something that we look at uh, and I think it puts us ahead of many other university cities actually, that, that graduate retention, keep keeping the talent that's come through our university or our school or our college system uh, in the city. Uh, and in fact, when I have conversations with inward investors, so I speak a lot to businesses who are wanting to come into the city, particularly now the digital and tech sector that, that we know, you know we're such a, a pioneering place for, for digital businesses. And, and one of the big things that attracts them is the, is the talent retention that we've managed to do. So, so it is, uh, at the, when you look at some of our economic strategies that, that um, re retaining of talent, uh, growing talent, creating opportunities, we have a whole team that Angela Harrington runs that leads on skills. Uh, on opportunities at different stages of life, but definitely kind of the, the graduate offer, apprenticeship offer, that kind of thing. So, so we put kind of skills and economic growth right, right next to each other um, and have lots of sessions with the different universities. They come together as a group. Uh, we have, have um, a huge kind of amount of consultation with them and, and the college network as well. Uh, and then we also do a lot in the kind of physical uh, development space, if you like, at looking at university campuses, looking at how we can, um, create a better offer for our students to, you know, the facilities that you have access to, the links between um, coming out of university, say if you're in the science sector and going into some of the startups, some of the hubs, I now sit on the um, uh, board for Manchester Graphene Company, which is fascinating, you know, that, that's such an amazing material, but, but there's so much more that can flow from the kind of discovery and the intellectual property around graphene uh, that will create opportunities for future generations. So. So uh, really central, you know, that the re retention, keeping the talent in the city, creating the opportunities, um, we put teams around that and, and do a lot to, to make sure that happens. Because I think if we lost, if we started to see that kind of brain drain that some cities suffer from, that would be, you know, really bad news for us as, a, as an economy. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for that answer, Louise. Thank you, Charlotte. Lovely to have you with us in the city. We're super thankful you stayed on. Um, so I, I, selfishly, I quite like this next question because it's slightly relevant for um, my company also. Um, is Duncan Firth with us? Would he like to ask his question just around SMEs, if that's at all possible? Maybe not. Is Duncan with us? Okay, well, well, we'll leave that momentarily just in case he comes back on. Um, is Jamie Ferguson still here? Would like to ask his question. Hello, yes. Hi, um, thank you for joining. Hi, hi Louise. Um, it was just, a, I guess, reflecting on the fact that you've been here for a little while now and I appreciate it's been very disrupted uh, by COVID and you've perhaps not spent as much time in Manchester as you might have expected at, at the outset, but um, having, you know, got to know the city, got to know um, the people in it and, and spent more time uh, walking through it. I wondered what perhaps your reflections were on some of the unrealized assets in the city for the, in terms of the public realm. Um, we spent a lot of time building, it was interesting you mentioned the blue line there in the canal network. We spent a lot of time 
building and regenerating along that kind of network, but perhaps not really putting very much back into it. I think probably taking from it quite a lot. Um, just wondered what your your thoughts were really, what you what you'd noticed moving around the city. Thank you, Jamie. And I think are you the amazing photographer? Have I been <laughs> following you on on Twitter? Is that you? Perhaps it's not you, but there's, there's somebody who posts amazing pictures of Manchester. Well, I'll take credit for it. If, if maybe not, but uh, I'll take that. Thanks. <laughs> All right then. Uh, but it is. It's a. It's a photogenic city, uh, isn't it? And and I do. You know, as I say, I've had uh, quite a lot of time in the summer and autumn months, uh, and I don't know that many people in the city yet. So quite often, when I'd finish work, I'd go for a walk around. You know, just just explore. That's something I really enjoy doing. Uh, and there, there is, you always see something different. Uh, so that's the, the richness of the city. The, the architecture is, historic architecture is great, but we've got some wonderful contemporary architecture as well. My overall take is that we've kind of got um, uh, a series of areas that kind of work quite well, actually. Bits of Ancoats really coming together around, uh, say, the, the marina, um, what the sort of vitality that, that is coming uh, into that area of the city is, is transformational. You know, the northern quarter was buzzing with all those outdoor cafes and things when, when I walked around. Uh, you then get kind of um, quieter areas, don't you, that have felt a bit more uh, emptied out. And, and it struck me that there's a series of kind of uh, neighbourhoods and areas that actually work quite well, but they don't necessarily all connect together. So, so that's a piece of work we've been talking about this morning with some, some landscape architects, actually, and some urbanists about how, how can we better connect the city. We've got, we've got so many great assets, but they're not always the first things you kind of find. Uh, there's some work going on to refresh some of our kind of key spaces. So we just started to consult on Piccadilly Gardens, which, uh, you know, for me is that that space where a lot of people do find that space when they arrive in the city, if you're coming up from the station, if you're walking across the town hall or over from Ancoats or whatever. So it, it's a real hub, isn't it? And, and I think there's more we can do around kind of uh, the redesign of that space, wayfinding through the city, getting those kind of visual and physical connections to the waterways. There's a, there's a lot we can do to open our connections to, to blue infrastructure. And I think that's relatively, um, you know, it's, it's not a huge puzzle. It, it's just a case of putting some of the plans in place, some of the collaboration uh, and funding. And we've now um, started conversations with National Trust, um, who we don't necessarily think of as an urban institution, but, but a lot of their um, uh, membership they tell us is is urban based you know are people who in the city who are members of the trust who then go out and explore national trust assets you know in, in country parks or rural areas but actually the national trust want to do more in the city they want to help us kind of um uh unravel uh some of the the um barriers to getting access to heritage to open up you've got amazing catacombs haven't we? we've got amazing kind of underground spaces uh uh, whole whole networks of um, heritage, both from the industrial past uh, and for the for more recent history, that that we kind of could do an awful lot to to share and and showcase. So I think it's a, a long answer to your question, but it's a very rich kind of tapestry that we have across Manchester. It feels a little bit disconnected in places for me, uh, and I think there's more we can do just to connect the assets we already have and and then enhance them. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. That's brilliant. We've just got a couple more questions before we finish. Thank you for staying on and thank you, Louise. Um, I'm just going to invite Emma um, Williams just to ask her question if Emma's around. Hi. Yep. Hi, Louise. Um, I'm Emma. I sit on the FBE committee. I also work for Morgan Sindel. Um, kind of going back, you've, you've already made quite a few references to um, the various public realm projects that are in the pipeline for Manchester, but um, I was just wondering which public space in Manchester are you most excited to see come to life? Hi, Emma. It's very, very nice to meet you. I've seen you on a few forums as well. It's nice to, to get too. to know you. Um, gosh, this, this is like favourite building question, isn't it? <laughs> I'm never very good at picking the ultimate favourite. Uh, I'll tell you some spaces I'm excited to see. One, because it's right by my office and has been behind hoardings all the time. I've been in the city and that's Albert Square. Uh, I think, you know, when that opens up, I, I feel like I don't really uh, fully get Albert Square because it's been behind kind of, um, uh, you know, all the construction scaffolding and, and the netting and the barriers uh, that we've got to make it safe at the moment. But I think that will be an amazing space. We've been looking at the plans that Planet and others have brought forward. Um, 
thinking about how that space will be used when the festival is on, uh, how the, the buildings around and, and that kind of outdoor sitting space that we're now seeing in, in say the Northern Quarter or Ancoats, you know, we, we know that we can make that far more of that kind of European year round uh, space um, re really starting to spill uh, across what is currently roads in, into the square. So I think that will be a really um, important urban kind of you know, centrally urban space. Uh, I think we're also going to have some um, uh, really different offers through the park that comes forward at Mayfield. That, that's going to uh, use some of that heritage. We're going to keep a lot of the industrial kind of relics and architecture that's on the site, but integrate it with nature. So that will feel very different. It won't feel as formal. I think it will feel more, more kind of um, more naturalistic in the planting and so on that's going on there. And there's lots of uh, resident engagement that we need to do to make sure it, it kind of resonates with with people in that part of the city. And then, as I've said, some of the, the spaces around um, Northern Gateway, just, just at the planning stage now, but, but they will be um, transformational. When I worked in Boston, there was, a, there was a brilliant park that dates back to the 1850s called the Emerald Necklace. So it's, a, it's um, an Olmsted park that connects neighborhoods across Boston through a series of green spaces that, that look like kind of jewels on, on a necklace, if you like. So it's a series of, of linear spaces that thread through the city green spaces. Uh, I always thought the Emerald Necklace was a great name, but but actually the the um, the opportunities that we have in the Northern Gateway give us that chance to kind of really create those those series of, of jewels that will link the north into the centre of the city. Great question. Thank you, Emma. Um, and finally, we're just going to finish with a question from Matt Dixon. Um, I think it's a fairly topical question, something relevant for us as we finish. Is Matt around? Would he like to ask that question? Thanks very much, Lucy. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Louise. I'm Matt Dixon. Pleasure to meet you. Um, yeah, this obviously, keeping on a theme but slightly different take, is that obviously, as you mentioned, you know, we're looking as time to come back at economic recovery post COVID and trying to look at that from a more positive aspect and how we encourage people back from the city and one of the things you know the various types of these events that have been throughout the year that I've picked up on is whilst you know it's been a good opportunity for the towns there have been quite a lot of other leaders of other greater Manchester boroughs and wider who've been very aware that if the city Manchester city centre doesn't get its vibrancy back then we will all suffer in the long term and one of the things to me that struck me is you know part of that is going to be a confidence boost for people to have you know even once we reach a position when we can come back in you know safely and, and access people will still need some assurance in how they can freely access the city and move around and again coming back to I guess that theme but a slightly different variant in that in terms of how people navigate through Manchester and some of those spaces and 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 perhaps some of the opportunity streets which might not be you know as well known or you know a little bit quieter at the moment and not the usual route of Market Street onto Deansgate and, and return back out of the city. I just wondered what scope you saw for some of those, let's call them opportunity streets, to allow people to have that bit of dwell time, bit of breathing space to feel like they can more safely return to the city. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matt, and it's, it's good to meet you. Again, a great question. It's exactly what we've been looking at this morning, actually. So, so there's a, um, a bit for me about getting some strategic uh, visioning underway, which which we're going to uh, be more public about fairly soon. We're just starting the, the thinking and the scoping of that. But but um, if you again, if you think of how Manchester responded um, post Arndale bomb, say, then it was about being being on the front foot, <laughs> being clear about what we see as the the future of the city, and that's the kind of space we're moving into now. We we need to to bring forward plans that that build confidence, that help us build partnerships. Um, and one of my team, uh, Kate McDonald, was saying that she started to do some analysis of almost the forgotten spaces, that the lost spaces. That actually, there's some of those magical spaces, aren't they, where where you maybe do get great great photographs, or you, you can kind of go and uh, and have a pause, um, take some time out uh, away from from a busy day job or an office kind of based role. So so I think there's a bit early on to do some visioning around what we what we see as the future of the city. So it's a mapping around what we've got, because I think actually a lot of it is probably already there and, and then getting plans in place that we can bring investors, you know, the city can't fund everything. So, so we need to find ways that, that um, bringing forward some of those spaces can be done in partnership because, because the adjoining buildings will benefit or the, the landowners will benefit. So that's, that's the stuff we're starting to work through now. And I think we're probably going to be living for quite a while where 
there will be restrictions and that, that access to outside space will matter. And so how we animate our outside spaces, we've been talking about some modular parklets, you know, that these other cities are doing. We want to bring those on stream pretty quickly. We want to work with universities, uh, designers, students have competitions for their ideas. You know, what, what is not just what the city council think, it's, it's what the people of the city want. Um, so a lot of consultation about what do you want your future city to be and, and what kind of spaces do you want to kind of find when you come into the city? Because I think you're right, it, it, the city will look a bit different to, you know, some businesses uh, will will not be there in the same way they they were pre-pandemic. Some of our hospitality sector has been really challenged. So, so we've got to find ways of breathing kind of life back back into those um, uh, businesses where we can and and innovating and getting new new kind of businesses and offers underway to, to keep Manchester the vibrant place that, that we know it to be and uh, and can help it uh, to continue to be. Brilliant, thank you very much. Yeah, that's good to hear. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you everyone to ask, who's asked a question. It's been brilliant to have your participation as we've been doing this little section. Thank you, Louise, for answering so brilliantly. It's so tricky on Zoom, but it's been lovely to hear your heart on all of these things. I'm just going to hand over now to Stuart and he's just going to close for us. Thanks, Lucy. Um, and, and hi, everybody. Um, Stuart Grant, the, the current chair of, of FB Manchester, very proud to, to be part of today. I don't know about you, but I can I really, really enjoyed all of that. Some great Q, Q and A, understandably, off the back of such a relaxed conversation. Um, and Louise, thank you. Such a fascinating insight into um, and getting getting under the skin of your own personal influences and design and placemaking philosophy. Uh, I think it's really clear that the uh, the blend of your international perspective, your public private sector experience, focus on social value and and obviously your commercial expertise is a perfect match for the considerable challenges uh, and opportunities now facing Manchester in a post COVID world. So we all wish you the very best in that. And as we talked about earlier, it's almost three three years since you you last spoke to FBE in your Homes England capacity. Uh, we're certainly not going to leave it as long till next time. Just a brief update, everybody, on, on our sort of event plan moving forward over the next six months. Obviously, we're keen to get back into to real events, but we recognise we can't do that for some time. So just in the wings, currently, we've got, um, uh, in no particular order, but we had a Homes communities and placemaking event that was literally due to roll out as a physical event last March and we couldn't. So we're going to make that happen and bring that online. Some leading designers um, that will be showcasing the influence of quality design as a catalyst for communities to thrive and prosper. Um, and I know that we've got Pete Swift on this call because Pete's going to chair that one for us. So that'll be an interesting and uh, energetic debate. We've also got a sequel to uh, our popular and now for something completely different event that we had a couple of years ago. So expect lots of disruption um, and, and sort of some thought, thought provoking and entrepreneurial speakers there. Um, any Monty Python enthusiasts, please come forward with your own thought of the title. We might just call it the, the meaning of life. Um, government's 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution. Um, well, we've got a wide range of influential speakers lined up, focused on some sort of blue sky thinking and innovative thinking to accelerate adoption and to make things happen. Uh, and a big thing that we're all looking forward to is some social. I think, uh, please God, that we can make that happen. We're really keen to return to somewhere like Hatch uh, and have a mega party where we can all do that safely, reconnect properly. And, um, and share the FBE love. Details to follow shortly on all those. So finally, again, just to thank and reiterate our thanks to Louise. Thank you so much for your time and for your thought provoking contributions today, Louise. To Martin, Martin Ellaby for making it happen in the first place and for your skills, Martin, in opening up the dialogue with Louise. To Martin the Marv Lucas for opening at the event and for showing us his new shirt. We were totally impressed with that shirt, Marv. Uh, to Lucy for handling the Q&A session so well, uh, and to all the FBE team for helping pull this session together. As always, a great team, 
uh, and fun to be part of. Thank you to Hydrock and to Doodle Do for your continued support to FBE for sponsoring the event today. We couldn't do without it. We couldn't do it without you guys. Uh, if any of you watching today is interested in sponsoring an event in the future, please get in touch with any of us on the committee. So thanks to you all for joining. Thanks for all your questions. Thanks for, for getting involved. Um, it is Friday. Um, and of course, it's tough times uh, at the moment. Lots of challenges ahead, but there's some great opportunities as well. Uh, it's just good to be alive, I think. I think it's fair to say. So let's all, let's all keep in touch uh, with each other. Spring's around the corner. It, it is a bit misly outside, but the daffodils, the daffodils are bursting outside my window. So let's remember all those reasons to be cheerful. Have a great weekend. Thanks again. Take care. See you soon. Bye.